Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray in Beijing. The Paris Agreement, designed to start in 2020, entered into force on November the 4th, when UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon called the historic day. While this unprecedented achievement shows a clear commitment from countries across the globe to tackle climate change, there is much more work to be done during the Maharashtra Climate Change Conference to translate this commitment into action. So, what barriers will remain for the implementation of the Paris Agreement, and will the result of the American election make any difference to the outcome? How should China finish its transition to low carbon emissions? And a resilient future. To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the studio by Ma Jun, director of the Institution of Public and Environmental Affairs, and Wu Changhua, China director of the Third Industrial Revolution. But before we begin discussion, let's take a look at this. United Nations climate talks opened on Monday in Morocco against the backdrop of a U.S. election that could have a major impact on the global agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So far, 100 countries have formally joined the agreement adopted, including top polluters China, the United States, the European Union, and India. If we want to achieve success as fast as possible, we must solve the problems with action. It is clear that we must take action, and all the participants should engage actively and take actions as a strategic policy for development. The agreement was reached at the Paris COP21 summit last year, where it was pledged to keep global temperatures from rising more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The accord also laid out a long-term plan to reach peak greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, and every five years, each country's progress in cutting emissions will be subject to review. And two months ago, at the Hangzhou G20 summit. China and the U.S. jointly ratified the Paris Agreement. The two countries account for about 38 percent of global carbon emissions, making their ratification crucial. To achieve the country's ambitious goal of tackling climate change, China has rolled out a series of environmental measures. UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon has spoken highly of China's contributions to the global fight against climate change. When it comes to China, I can only. Say how much grateful we are, not only me, whole international community. Only with China and United States、uh, <coughs> depositing, ratifying this,、uh, we reached 39 percent. Two countries. It has shown great the political impact. When the deal was reached here in Paris last year, few imagined that by the time they convened for the next climate change conference, the agreement would be in force. Now that it is, the focus in Marrakesh will be on how to make sure the pledges made in the past year will be kept and how they can be improved on. Welcome to dialogue. I've heard a great divergence of public opinions about the Paris Agreement. However, it took the 1997 Kyoto Protocol eight years to. Enter into force. Yet, in sharp contrast, the Paris Agreement takes less than one year to be enforced. What is the reason, or what are the fundamental reasons behind the、uh, acceleration of the speed? I think different ways of looking at it. One is the political will. I think globally, the political will、uh, managed to come together and to support the global effort to tackle climate change. So compare now and the Kyoto Protocol, that was very very different. Secondly, I think on the consensus. Consensus meaning say this partly this obligation responsibility, but very very importantly, it's a different way of transforming our economic growth direction because technology is available. It creates huge economic opportunities to for new industrial revolution and. If you put the carbon pricing around it, actually, that's going to provide the biggest incentives to, for countries to go forward. Uh, so uh, the third element to look at, it, basically, I think the level of confidence. And now, if you look at renewable energy, clean energy development,、uh, energy efficiency, we have the technologies, and many cases actually they are proven. Not only technology, but also business model. And back then, around the Kyoto time, we didn't really have that sort of luxury to support that. And、uh, lastly, I think the public awareness and people basically started to understand the climate change better and really has. The, probably the highest desire for change.、Uh, Tanghua addressed the issue of、uh, confidence, uh, political will, uh, and uh, public awareness. Uh, but what about the capabilities? 
I mean, uh, developed countries promised to provide developing nations with 100 billion US dollars starting from 2020. And many observers, including senior leaders from developing countries, are pretty pessimistic about the readiness or willingness of those policymakers in developed nations to really translate it into action, to really give them the cash. Yeah, I think that uh, that 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 has a uh, you know there's a huge question question mark about that. You know, for all these countries came together in Paris, shows the the great consensus. You know, the words kind of really concern about this issue as a whole. Uh, however, when it comes to money, uh, when it comes to compensation, you know, of the historical responsibility of the Western countries uh, for those, you know, not not China, not India, you know, it's really underdeveloped countries who who made absolutely very little impact on this whole thing uh, contribution to this greenhouse gases uh, emission but who are suffering the most the low island countries the African countries uh, who are really suffering you know we they supposed to get compensated but this amount of money you know even the very figure hundred billion dollars whether it's just a, a whole only hundred billion or every year it should be hundred billion uh, there's a confusion and bigness in this um, uh, Paris agreement itself so this will lead to some real uh, debate and discussion. Margin, with the goal of keeping global temperatures from rising two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by centuries end, huge reductions in carbon dioxide emissions are still needed and nations still must shave 25% of the predicted emissions by 2030 to maintain the two degree goal. Is this likely to happen to ensure countries comply with such a tough requirements to report their progress in cutting carbon emissions? Yeah, that's uh, another big question mark here uh, uh, about the uh, Paris Agreement. You know, when all this uh, voluntary uh, emission reduction target put together is not big enough to ensure a uh, a, a two point uh, uh, zero you know degree Celsius uh, uh, increase, l let alone say one point five degrees. And so uh, we need to actually do more. Uh, but. Um, uh, uh, but now the the issue here is that uh, uh, you know in Marrakesh we need to work out the action plan. You know if you want to ensure 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, the ambition more ambitious target, then the window opportunity is 20. Uh, everyone need to take real big action to cut uh, cut emission. But um, but many other nations they're not quite ready. You know this got hastened up the whole process. Uh, luckily, you know China, United States. There are some action plans, but uh, many other countries, most others, they are they are not quite ready for that. And um, and and then you know beyond 2020, if you don't have an action plan leading up to 2020, there's a there's a doubt about beyond 2020 whether you know we're going to be able to make more ambitious plan. Having said that. I think when all this self-voluntary kind of uh, emission target put on the table, uh, there's kind of a hope that every country is kind of making some sort of uh, uh, leaving some sort of uh, space for real bigger action already. So we hope that uh, during the implementation of the whole thing, there will be more creative solutions developed by the countries and by the industries um, with the support from the whole public. Can I just uh, add a little bit on that? I think that, yes, on one side, very positively, we have the international pro you know, agreement, whatever, uh, effective now. But in it, actually, there are many, many things that still need to happen. For instance, review, revise of the targets, commitment targets. So there is a timeline, say, 2018. All the countries will be called together, review. Say, whatever the level, you, a commitment you've made already, should you lift it up? Right, because we all know whatever is on the table today is not going to be really lead us to where we want it to be. So hopefully somehow by 2018, the international process will do review process. And hopefully through that process, many countries will be able to become more ambitious, lift up. So this is sort of process actually the international community is going through, which at all. I see some conflicting reports about China. On the one hand, China has successfully reduced its carbon intensity by 20% during the 12th five year plan period, namely between 2010 and 2015, surpassing the original 17%. On the other hand, 
the general public in major cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, now they all face, uh, perhaps excluding Shenzhen, the increasing concerns about uh, smog. Beijing has been able to survive four rounds of uh, smog since October. I mean, this is a really devastating for the locals mm -hmm. and perhaps for the overseas multinationals to yeah. take a second look at whether they should uh, be here uh, to establish and maintain their formidable presence here. What do you think of the, uh, uh, the conflicting reports here? Yeah, the conflict uh, comes from this very simple, f you know, actually it's, a, it's not that complicated. It's a, first it's about carbon intensity or energy efficiency. You know, on this efficiency side, we're, we're keeping actually you know during the past 20 years it keep going up and up and now it's uh, you know for some industries it's quickly catching up but on the other hand because the sheer scale of our economy is expanded so substantially you know exponentially uh, as a result the whole total volume of discharge both on the carbon side and on, on the local emission side has been dramatically increased you know I just give one figure, you know, this is about our coal consumption. From the year 2000 to the year 2013, our coal consumption have literally tripled. Tripled. And making it the words, you know, making it a fact that we consume at that moment half of the world's coal. You can imagine half of the coal burned in our country mm -hmm. and they're very concentrated. Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, 400 million tons. Shandong alone, 400 million tons. And then Jiangsu, uh, Shanghai, and plus Zhejiang, another 400 million tons. What about India? I've heard a lot about the uh, worsening pollution in major cities of India, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. economy that is only uh, catching up very quickly and threaten GDP growth. And they are proud of this. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm afraid they are getting uh, suffocated by the increasing smog. Uh, it's really unfortunate. I think we started to see the shift, right, so moving towards different regions. So China sort of know, 20 years ahead of India. So we've gone through this very difficult period of time, this journey, actually, heavy polluting sort of journey. Now we're witnessing that in India. Uh, can they solve it? Uh, theoretically, probably many experts say, yes, uh, we have technologies. For instance, don't burn coal. Go to renewable energy, solar, you know, uh, the energy, whatever, and uh, just abandoning the coal, but how, who bear the cost, right? So it's a very difficult economic decision India has to make. Would they willing, be people willing to sacrifice their health, environmental health, and people's health, actually, for the growth they are pursuing now, or they would like to somehow figure out the solution to the puzzle, say, okay, yes, maybe technology today are expensive, somehow we're willing to pay for that. That's a, sort of the biggest puzzle I think every country, developing country in particular, needs to figure out. There's no problem about the political will, the confidence, the consensus, the public awareness, and the increasing capabilities throughout the country to tackle the issue of climate change. However, in contrast, we heard appalling stories about the ISL in Iraq to set oil wells ablaze mm -hmm. when they evacuate their troops. Uh, from Mosul, uh, mm -hmm. capital city of uh, the ISIL, um, the so-called Islamic State, with the U.S.-backed military actions well underway. Um, mm -hmm. um, and we see, uh, as Margin said uh, a few minutes ago, the huge, huge consumption of billions of uh, tons of uh, coal, which account for 70 percent of the power generation in our country over the past decade or so. So is the globe, is the world getting warm? warming up more quickly, mm -hmm. will that amount to a suicide? Uh, to a large extent, no. I think you captured it very correctly. I think that's a sort of in the human nature, say, we pursue certain things by sacrificing the others. Today, actually, I think on the one side, we do see things like that happening. If you look at the climate change issue, scientists are you know, been repeatedly telling us, so we're really in a crisis, and it's affecting, hitting us really, really hardly. And if you look at extreme weather, the cities, the regions around the world are literally suffering from that process, creating even you know climate refugees, whatever, causing all many, many challenges. Actually, on the other side, positively, there are technologies. We actually know how to solve this problem. 
So if you look at even coal-related, we know efficiency becomes very important. If you improve dramatic efficiency, somehow you're going to reduce the use of coal. You can、um, substitute through cleaner, you know, renewable energy, wind and solar, and others. In the meantime, actually, you can have other options to reduce the coal consumptions there. Then the bigger question is、so、why not now, right? Why are we still postponing the actions at this moment? Are we stupid? Uh, this is a bigger question to answer, actually. So on one side, if you look at the Paris process, why it was successful? Because we seem to know more. We seem to feel more confident. Actually, we're going to solve this problem. But on the other side, actually, the pace and the scale, we're not just there. There's a huge gap, you know, between our expectations and the actions today. So hopefully, through the international process and also through countries' ambitions like China, we'll be able to speed up the process. To really scale up the solutions on low carbon technology or clean technologies, there because today technology is no longer a major barrier. We all have proven technologies, and they make economic sense. So that requires the government incentives, technology innovators together with the industries, with the finance, and with the public design. We need to put everything together actually to solve this. Yes, indeed. Low carbon development remains a huge task for our mankind. The Paris Agreement, designed to start in 2020, entered into force on November the 4th. We are discussing challenges lying ahead. Stay with us. We'll be back. Welcome back. A, bro a broad and big question remains. Changhua and Margin. Although the price of renewable energy has fallen considerably in recent years, the world is still struggling to win itself from the easily obtained energy sources that have garnered billions of profits in the industrial age. Do you think that can change in the short to mid-term, medium term, or will low-carbon technology eventually become more competitive, Margin? Yeah.、Uh, I do see, you know, over the long run,、uh, our prospect of、uh, winning, you know, from the、uh, coal-based uh, uh, economy is、uh, is is quite rosy. But、uh, but in the short,、um, near term, and medium term, I, I still see、uh, great challenges. You know,、uh, on the、uh, you know some countries,、uh, those in the、uh, countries in northern Europe, you know, some of them have actually pretty successfully. Uh, uh, shifted, you know, tr transformed their their economy to a low carbon economy、uh, quite successfully. Uh, but um, but there are many other countries still struggling, you know,、um, including、uh, including our country. You know, in China, there's a now there's a real political will to deal with the, this、uh, this problem. I talked about the huge increase of coal consumption. That has been that. That increase have、uh, have been hugely, you know, reduced. At this moment, it's、uh, it's no longer, you know,、uh, uh, grow that much. But our our challenge is how to, you know, make sure they will peak. You know,、uh, the whole thing will peak first the, the coal consumption and then the whole energy、uh, consumption, the whole carbon emission will peak by 2030,、uh, and hopefully bef even before that.、Uh, but But try to, you know, when you try to do that, there are still big challenges. You know, our energy-intensive industry is way too big, you know, at this moment for us to develop sufficient capacity of wind or、uh, solar or those renewable、um, uh, powers. And and we already, the very fact we already got a third of the world's wind power, but our, you know, our our wind power capacity is twice as big as the United States. But unfortunately, the whole power generated every year is just、uh, not as much as th theirs. So there's a huge issue of how to manage this.、Uh, how to manage this? So technology-wise, there's way to, and we need to improve. But also on the management side, you know, it's not just to on the installation capacity. It's also about how do we really make the arrangement. An issue of governance. The, the issue of governance. Productivity and efficiency. Uh, in the power grid that is fast emerging as、uh, an alternative、uh, to the use of uh, uh, fossil fuel,、um, the first、uh, environmental protection law, the first of its kind in China, went into effect on January the first.、Uh, your institution of、uh, public and environmental affairs、uh, serves as a watchdog somehow、uh, to help the government exercise oversight、mm -hmm. and hopefully bring environmental decline under control. What? Penalties or、uh, punishment have 
possibly be meted out ever since. Can you brief us about the progress? Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, that, that environmental protection law, the first uh, revision after 25 years, came into effect uh, January the 1st last year. This year, it was the air uh, pollution prevention law came into effect. Mm -hmm. All this kind of uh, dubbed as uh, very stringent laws. Uh, and we do see that more penalty fines got imposed uh, and uh, we do see some of you know the the limit for this uh, for this fines grow from just uh, literally 200,000 yuan the most and now it's uh, it's about 1 million yuan uh, and now you know last this year alone uh, up to now some uh, 500 million yuan have been uh, you know, of, of uh, penalty fines have been imposed uh, based on the online, you know, monitoring of all those repeated uh, uh, polluters have been penalized. Having said that, this is just a tiny fraction of the whole big, you know, cost that they they generated. You can imagine. I mean, our we spent, you know, every time when we make the plan to deal with air, water, and soil, it's about trillion. Yeah. We're talking about trillion yuan. But this is 500 million. You know, you, you can see the cost of violation is still way too low. Mm -hmm. We need to increase that. But in the meantime, we need to also try to try to uh, tap into the, the power of market approach. At this moment, you know, in this Marrakesh meeting, you know, I was I, I was helping a group of Chinese property developers. You know, the member of the ICE Foundation, Alashan ICE Foundation preparing for their green supply chain project. For the first time in the, in the world, they decided to use the data we compiled, the enforcement data, to manage the iron steel and cement suppliers. Those who are on the, on the blacklist may face their, you know, they may not be able to continue to buy from them. I think all this put together should be the way for us to enforce our local rules. But in the meantime, it also gives hope for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Because at the end of the day, it's not just the government. You need people to join. You need private sectors to be part of the solution. Tanghua, are you aware of the required of a huge commitment to the protection of the environment? Uh, because for us, who are very skeptical about the efficiency of the governance, uh, we point out that it's actually a matter of a mouse and cat game. Mm. Uh, during the daytime, they most of the polluters uh, seem to uh, comply with the law. When the night falls, uh, they start to release the industrial wastes. So what about the alleged uh, constant around the clock 724 supervision against uh, such illegal behavior? Uh, I am aware of the efforts made by a lot of Chinese business leaders, uh, companies today, uh, like this particular one is from property developers, not only property sector, but other many other sectors as well. So they are very good role models from the business community already. They are driving, leading actually the change, the positive change. But as you said, actually, on the other side, there are always people or business leaders basically not in that sort of league. What do we do? For these guys in the underdeveloped nations, it's a matter of a make and break. It's to be or not to be. It's for it the survival is. and bread and butter of the local uh, workers, uh, the industrial workers. Uh, they may well be made redundant if uh, stringent, uh, stringent and severe laws are to be implemented effectively. That's part of the sacrifice we had to go through. That's why you cannot leave everything actually to your company. Then do you expect the central government or authorities at different levels to give compensations for those workers who are made jobless as a result? That's only part of the solution. So either so the company doesn't really do anything just to say, okay, sorry, you, you, you're not in compliance with the environmental standards, you have to shut it down. So that's one way. If that fa factory is shut down, all the jobs actually will be gone. And then, of course, it, the, the duty of governments and other players in the society trying to make sure people's life will, livelihood will be maintained. Uh, that's a rather sort of a very passive way. So there are other ways. The first is the government can step in because technology is available. If there is a market potential for this particular company, you can support them. The subsidy is not giving them the money, but providing incentives, some financing support, actually incentives to support the companies to transition by adopting more efficient actually technologies so that the factory will continue to be open, people still stay on jobs, you can continue to train them, whatever. So that probably would be more preferred option rather than, so you fail to comply with environmental standards, you have to be shut down. I think that's a sort of extreme, very passive way. 
On the other side, beside the business community, I started to see cities, regions also taking actions. Cities like Zhenjiang, Ningbo, Guiyang, and many others, they started to look at the city land urbanization process and trying to make sure actually the infrastructure they're going to build are not going to be sort of locked in situation, high carbon intensive, whatever. But in the meantime, they're looking to say low carbon, sustainable, ecological, boundary, things like that. So if you look at Zhenjiang as an example, the city probably has already put on the table something called eco ecological cloud, using the big data, ICT technologies to really understand the landscape of the ecological situation, but very importantly, using that tool to manage actually at the emissions, the environment, energy situation. First in Zhenjiang, already 31 industrial companies are literally connected online, being watched day and night actually, in terms of the energy consumptions, emissions. So back to the question earlier you mentioned, say there are a lot of, yeah, there are bad people, bad guys actually in the society, but somehow you need to create tools, instruments to watch them. I wonder if you guys could call the president-elect Donald Trump a bad guy. I don't <laughs> think he would be called a bad guy, but he, <laughs> His biggest and surprise win did catch many observers abroad totally and utterly unprepared. And it's even this, his own team. This yeah. man, uh, on his previous campaign trails, vowed to pull the United States out of the uh, Paris Agreement commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? What can be done to bring him to the normal track? Yeah, he said he, uh, during the campaign trail, he, he said he's going to uh, cancel. Uh, the Paris Agreement, and this is a, this was actually one of the reasons for many nations to to hasten their that process uh, to ratify that, so so that to make it uh, you know uh, make the Paris Agreement uh, effective, uh, because you know once you make it effective, then it took at least uh, five years you know, before you can you know finish the process uh, to to pull out. So it means that. Uh, you know, probably during his uh, his one term, maybe uh, it, it was uh, it would be quite difficult uh, for him to uh, to do that. And um, of course, having said that, uh, this type of uh, uh, distrust uh, to the uh, 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 the global efforts made to combat uh, uh, climate change will not be very helpful. I hope that uh, you know this is more about uh, only about his campaigning. Uh, rhetoric, you know, so much have been have been said, and I don't think all this going to be, you know, eventually been fully materialized. I think he will still recognize that, um, you know, not just the environmental impact, but um, the whole kind of a sustainable use of uh, of resources. You know, the uh, all this uh, global, you know, uh, all this um, disasters caused by this uh, uh, climate um, uh, impact. Well, you know, I, I think as a, as the president, I hope he will have a better review of that. You know, he's a, I, I don't think he, he actually, you know, uh, be fully prepared uh, uh, to review everything because before he, 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 he do this job, he hasn't served one day in the in public, the office. The public <laughs> office. So, so now I think it's time for him to really and sit and down. And therefore, the hallmark in yes, yeah. giving a portrait about this uh, president-elect is unpredictability. Yeah. So Can I get back to that question? All environmental yeah. issues uh, seem to be politics. <laughs> yes or no? Okay, there always everything actually could be turning into politics. Back to the Trump issue, actually, um, there is a risk. Uh, if, according to what he said on the campaign trail, right, and now he's the president-elect, so we'll see what, what's going to do. He has about two years uh, when he took take his, takes office to decide whether the United States will continue to honor the commitment to the Paris Agreement or not. So that, I think, it, to be fair, let's see. We didn't see. But in the meantime, yesterday, when he accepted the, sort of the success, he made a speech. In it, I was listening, actually. He said very, very, he cares about, actually, about energy price. And uh, so energy, like it or not, that's definitely going to be one major issue on the agenda because he has to pay attention to the price of energy and uh, because to make the competitiveness of American business community, whatever. So uh, on the carbon issue, he said he doesn't believe in climate change. On solar issues, actually, he doesn't believe in solar energy. So he thinks subsidizing renewable energy is a really bad decision. It's a stupid question and actions on the government side of there anyway. So that creates a lot of uncertainty, unpredictability. So we'll see what's going to happen. Thank you very yeah. much. With that, we come to the end of this discussion about climate change, and particularly the Paris Agreement. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.